Friday. This is the 11th session of our Brain Power series. I'm so glad that you could have joined us today again. We have looked at numerous little topics. The last one was intimacy and seduction and the impact this has on the brain. Let's recap a little bit. We looked at this diagram of, of a habit and we, we found that it's important that we know that our thoughts that forms part of this habit really filters through either principle or feeling. And if my principles are in place, I am safe in God's grace. No temptation has ever taken you but what is common to man, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able. But with that temptation also will make a way to escape so that you may be able to bear. I love this promise. It doesn't matter who says what. The Lord promises, I will give you escape. We can just say, Lord, help us to, to escape this a vile attempts of Satan to get us on our knees. We also learned how to change habits. And one of the principles I want to remind you of is the one uh, using the pain-pleasure principle, interrupting your syndrome uh, where unnatural conditioning begins. One or two statements, this one found in Mind, Character and Personality, page 601, says, Through the power of Christ, men and women have broken the chains of sinful habit. They've renounced unselfishness. The profane have become reverent. The drunken, sober. The privileged, pure. Souls that have been born the likeness of Satan have become transformed into the image of God. In one of the episodes coming, we're going to specifically look at this factor where God has created us in His image. And uh, this is really very exciting. We also looked at the, the cognitive decision making that is required in us making changes in our habits. And then I want to remind you of Mary Magdalene. He has done it for Mary. He wants to do it for you. Whatever she did, the Lord said, go and sin no more. Your sins are forgiven. May you be helped to get to a place where you can have peace, that your sins are forgiven, and you can walk this life in peace with our Creator God. I've seen your ways, he says, but I will heal you. I will also lead you. I will store your comforts to you. And we find this in Isaiah 57 verse 18. Now, who is in charge of this brain? Who is in charge of this brain? Let's talk about your mind and control. And how important this is that, that we keep this in the way God wants it. There are three things in life that we cannot control. And it's sometimes frustrating. One of them is our five senses. We cannot control what we see. If we look in a, in a direction, what is coming through the eyes is there. You cannot do anything about it. What you hear, you hear. What you taste, you taste. What you feel, you feel. So all our senses cannot be controlled. They are there or they are not there. Um, however, they can easily be fooled. And we need to keep this in mind. The second thing that we cannot control, and uh, I'm glad we cannot control this. We cannot control God. God is the creator. The fact is, I am his creation. I cannot change that. You cannot change that. Romans 9 verse 20 says, No, but O man, who are you? Replies against God. Shall the thing formed say to him, who formed it? Why have you made me this way? Verse 21, does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel to honor and another one to dishonor? God is the creator. And then the third one, your subconscious mind. You cannot control your subconscious mind. There's control in your conscious mind. But in your subconscious mind, you cannot control that. That's a little bit scary. And let's look at that in the session. 
the difference between the subconscious and the conscious mind is really profound. Let's look at this. Number one, everything in your subconscious mind is accepted and received as a fact. So whatever you look at, whatever you hear, whatever you experience, it is accepted and received and stored in your subconscious mind as fact, as if it has happened and as if it has happened with you. Then we need to know that there's no thinking happening here. There's no deliberations happening here. Um, we need to know that instinctively it responds to emotions and images from the conscious mind. So the conscious mind feeds the subconscious and then it's stored and it's stored as an fact. We also need to know that uh, the subconscious mind has access to all of the brain. It can go anywhere and gather information there and then store that information and this is really what makes me who I am. Let's look at the conscious mind. This is where thinking, this is where reasoning takes place. There's incoming information and data processed all the time. All the time I hear things, there's uh, feelings, there's emotions, all of that. I am just, I'm just, you know, using that data, I'm processing that, and constantly it's growing and changing all the time. We also need to know that it is conscience. It is, it's not, you know, something I don't know about. The conscious mind is, conscience is based there, right there in that, in, that, in that base of my conscious mind. And then spirituality is there. Uh, my spirituality is in my conscious mind. It's not something that's stored somewhere in my cup, uh, subconscious. It is there. It is, it is something I do cognitive decisions about all the time. Now, let's try and understand these two minds. Um, the one, and we, can, we, we give it this, this picture where it actually puts in the information and the subconscious mind actually should store it. And that should be the way it works. The subconscious mind is really, you know, the, the stronger emotion, the stronger the imprint on the subconscious mind. And let's give an example. Adultery, for instance. It is a very, very huge emotion that takes place when adultery takes place. It might not feel like that in reality, but really, in the subconscious mind, there's a big, big thing happening there. Lying is a very strong emotion. Um, you can just imagine what part of the brain is really in control. We're talking about control and mind control here. Murder, taking a human life, that is the strongest emotion that you can get. Well, this is really what we're exposed to all the time. When we look at television today, we are exposed to adultery, we're exposed to lying, we're exposed to murder all the time. And we are desensitized by this information, this media bombarding our brain all the time. In the conscious mind, uh, your control over this conscious mind can be overridden. And that is something we need to keep in mind. It can be overridden by hypnotism. God intended us to be in control of our minds. He doesn't even take control of our minds. How can we... Let go of our mind and let something or somebody else control it. So hypnotism is really very dangerous. But we need to know that I don't need to go to somebody that hypnotizes to be hypnotized. In circus, TV shows, it seems so harmless. But there is hypnotism even taking place while looking at these things. What happens is the beta waves in the brain disappears under uh, this hypnotic condition. And that, without these beta waves, we do no critical analysis incoming activity. We don't analyze it all. It just goes straight to the subconscious. It is stored there as fact. And something or somebody else takes control of my mind. That's scary. We see mass hypnotism nowadays, even in religious settings. Not good. 
Eastern meditation, yoga has the same sort of results. Music has the same result. I, I just, you know, when I think of music, and please let me explain, it's not all music. There is good music. There's music that could relax. There's music that could help me in my study methods. But we're talking about music that would bypass the conscious mind and go straight to the limbic system, the feeling, and it's stored in the subconscious mind as uh, an experience, a feeling experience. Uh, I think of this uh, little town we visited one day, and uh, everybody was just waving and, and very uh, friendly, and we had some lunch there on the, on the pavement in the park, and uh, people passed, they waved, they greeted, and here we hear this, I can't call it music, this noise coming down the street. And there's this young man walking with his cell phone. And uh, he's got it on loudspeaker. And now he walks there, you know, and he goes like this. And he goes down. The, and, and everybody greets, but he doesn't greet. We, we say hi. He doesn't hear. He doesn't recognize. He, doesn't, he just goes on. And you can see he's in a different mind. You know, music can really put you in a hypnotic condition. Well, it enters through the inner motion regions of the brain. And this is why you, in this setting, would just find your body starting doing things. You know, it's not like I need to tap my feet. It just happens, you know, and the body just follows. And it gives a large emotional response with very little logical and moral interpretation. This is really, I believe, where God doesn't want it to be. Researchers find that the rhythms change your brain structure and your chemicals, either for the better or for the worse. So yeah, even your, your, your rhythms of, of, your body rhythms are taken out. You know, your heartbeat, if you, if you go to research, it says, and we find that as the beat of the music go, your heart starts following the beat. And the faster it go, the faster your heartbeat would go. I cannot understand how people can pass exams listening to this uh, noise and uh, in their ears while they're trying to study. If they would rather go for the more classical tones that God really created for us. And that would stimulate the brain waves and the beta waves will be intact so that they would remember and consciously would be able to give that information back in an exam or wherever they are tested. Well, television does the same thing. It is really uh, a semi-hypnotic episode that it causes. Um, if you would stand outside of a room and, s and, and people are looking at television inside and there's curtains drawn, uh, what do you see? Normally, if you would stand outside, you would see a flickering of lights. Now, if you would go and time this, and I've done this because I don't always believe what everybody tells me, I went and tested myself and I saw that this flickering was shorter than three seconds at a time. And that is very interesting because the average scene on television lasts only three seconds. So it changes within three seconds. And what it means is the information reaches the memory and the emotion, but the frontal lobe is not involved in sorting out this facts because it needs more than three seconds to sort out is this fact or is this fiction. So the scene changes and now it's just recorded as fact in my subconscious mind. It goes straight there and it's stored there as a fact as if you have performed it. So when I see a, a picture of a couple having uh, illicit sex and... Uh, I record this because of the scenes changing. I record this as fact and as if I have done it. This leaves us with a big moral dilemma because many would not have acted the way they did, but the subconscious has made them think they have done it already themselves. So, you know, what is the challenge? The media is, uh, is used yeah, all the time. You know, it even affects the food you choose to eat. You know, you can't imagine that we, and, and this especially for the, for the men's market, they would use a lady halfly dressed to advertise certain thing to eat. Really scary. And yeah, the car you drive. And I went back to the old cars 
And I see, well, in the old times, they did the same thing. They use a lady to sell the car. And uh, in the newer modern time, we do the same thing. Now, the following verses talks about the conscious mind. And I want to just illustrate this. Proverbs 16, verse 2 and 3 says, All a man's way seems innocent to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. You see, in my conscious mind, motive is part of it. And that is a conscious thing. Motive is a conscious thing. Now, you know, we try to cover this up, but there is something that God weighs. He knows about it. Another one is Ephesians 6 verse 14, where it says, stand firm. And then the verse goes on. Stand firm. That's a conscious thing. I need to stand firm. God expects us to stand firm. You see, choice plays a great part in this function of the conscious mind. So the question is, who is in charge in your situation? Am I getting information through my conscious mind and it feeds my subconscious mind? Or is my subconscious mind in charge because the conscious mind is bypassed in, in whatever information? Now it's important to realize that when it comes to feelings and emotions, the limbic system, it means the frontal lobe is bypassed. It's filtered through that feeling. Much easier just to be stored in our subconscious mind. But when it comes to our conscious mind and our thoughts being filtered through principle, it means cognitively I decide to go a certain direction and I'm not going to go uh, another one. Well, Philippians 2 verse 5 says, For let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I believe in Jesus' mind, his conscious mind was in control. His subconscious mind was subject to his conscious mind. Matthew 4 verse 1 to 25 says, And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus stood temptation as you and I stand temptation on a daily basis. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Just imagine you not eating 40 days, 40 nights. And Satan sees this and he sees an opportunity. And what does he do? And the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Feed yourself. Why should you be hungry? Now, the fact is Jesus could do that because he was the son of God. But this was a temptation from Satan. And I love the way that Jesus gives the example of how to deal with this. From the Bible, he quoted to him. He answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I have made a cognitive principle decision that I want to follow God's way. I want to do God's will. Whatever comes from the mouth of God, that's good for me. Matthew 4 verse 1, 4 verse 1 to 25, we go on. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. You see, when the devil starts tempting, he doesn't stop. He goes on. Even with the Savior of the world, he does the same thing. He wants... He wanted Jesus to make a feeling decision. He wanted him to feel the motion of hunger and to act on that. But he made a principal decision long before the devil has actually tried to tempt him. He made that decision that the will of my father, that would be the only one that I'm going to take. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9 to 12 says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, this is what he does, and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deceptions among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send to them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 
make that decision. I want to go for the truth. I don't want to go for the unrighteousness. Galatians 5 is 16. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Live by the Spirit. You see, this is a choice. It's a cognitive decision that I make. I want to live by the Spirit. I don't want to live by the desires of the sinful nature. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. He gave us the conscious position, making decision, taking self-control ourselves to discipline ourselves. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. James 1 verse 13 to 14. For God cannot be tempted, and nor does he attempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desires is dragged away and enticed. Very easy for us to say today, you know, I'm just a human being. I'm just a weak person, and I can't help what I'm doing. God says, no. No, we are following our own evil desires. Make the choice. I want to follow God. I want to use principle that is put there rather than feelings, emotions, and then let the subconscious mind take over. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation, the Lord says in Matthew 26, verse 41. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Oh, we've got weak bodies. But watch and pray. You see, it takes a cognitive decision to say, I'm on a daily basis dis disciplining myself, taking control, spending time with the Lord, watching, praying, have a conversation with Him, have a connection with Him, and then I would be safe. Let's get back to 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. This is humans. This is a human thing. God is faithful. He is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you could bear. This statement really made an impact on me. And I want to read this to you. As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. In all manner of conversation, give up now and forever all wrong habits. Take yourself to task. Discipline yourself. Lift the cross, deny yourself. Control yourself. There's a, there's a duplication. Control yourself. Then, there's a result. Then there will be an opportunity for Christ to let His mind be in you. I believe this has been your prayer. This has been my prayer through every episode that God would teach me ways so that I would allow Him to have His mind in me. This quote by Ellen White, in found in the little book, Ministry of Healing, says, The power of self-restraint strengthens by exercise. That's not just physical exercise, but exercising my mind to do the right things. That which at first seems difficult, by constant repetition, grows easy until right thoughts and actions become habitual. I can derail the wrong habits by putting in the better habits. And I need to just take that conscious decision. About self-restraint. We go on. He, if we will. We may turn away from all that is cheap and inferior. And rise to higher standards. We may be respected by men beloved by God. Leo Shubin said. And I, I love the way he puts it. He says the problem is in the mind. Most people have established hundreds of negative destructive limiting and defiling associations to pleasure, and we should be associating them with, with pain. So we, 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 we look at something pleasurable, but it's actually pain long term. He goes on, he says, if you learn to think massive pain and discomfort to any destructive behavior or emotion habit, then you will avoid doing it at all cost. You can harness the principle of pain or pleasure to change virtually anything in your life. Just connect pain to something that might seem like pleasure but it's only for a short moment the brain must be healthy and this is really what this whole series is about every episode we're building on it the brain is the organ and instrument of the mind and controls the whole body 
in order for the other parts of the system to be healthy, the brain must be healthy. If I feed my brain, it's going to be healthy. And in order for the brain to be healthy, the blood must be pure. If by correct habits of eating and drinking, the blood is kept pure, the brain will be properly nourished and will give us all this good attributes that God has created it with. The mind controls all man. All our actions, good or bad, have this source in the mind. It is a mind that worships God and allies us to the heavenly beings. Yet many spend all their lives without becoming intelligent in regard to the casket. You know, this jewel case that contains the treasure. I know that if we make small little decisions in changing our way of thinking and the way of doing, we could write the same little message. This young man. He was in desperate, desperate situation where he failed all his subjects. He came to me crying and we helped him to change the way he eats, to change the way he drinks, to change the way he thinks. And after the exams, this was three, four weeks before exam, after the exams he wrote this little let letter to me via SMS and he said, Pastor Arnold, I'm the student who had the problem with the brain and some other things. I truly have seen things change. I hit more than 60% in all my exams. I truly thank you. I bless God for you. This is really what God can do and wants to do for you. You see, our bodies are broken. It's virtually impossible to have clear, productive, inspiring, and innovating thoughts in a physically malfunctioning body. Improved quality and quantity of life can only be determined by systematic change and i want to ask you are you ready to change are you ready to change for god gave us the spirit not of fear but of power and love and of self-control he really wants to do that for us now in our next episode we're going to look at the power of freedom how we can actually pave our way to success you can plan your own way to success by God's grace. May he be with you until we see you again. And uh, keep good choices in mind as you go on. See you next time.